when, when I'm talking to a libertarian and, and, and I make the point that the USDA food pyramid is not God's truth, they're like, oh, right, oh, right. of course it isn't. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, tonight at the Museum of Sex, a an evening presented by Reason. I'm John Tierney, and I'm here with John Durant, the caveman, um, he, who is, um, he's produced a great book, and he has a great background. He, he, uh, he studied evolutionary psychology at Harvard under Stephen Pinker, then came to New York and uh, uh, went into consulting and gained 20 pounds. And he started experimenting with a different kind of diet going back to a paleo diet. And along the way, he acquired a great following, sort of a cult following. He's got a website called huntergatherer.com. And he's just produced a wonderful book called The, the Paleo Manifesto. And this book gives you, in, in I think, three chapters, the, the scope of uh, the history of human evolution, um, all the way from the Paleolithic uh, to the present. It explains why Jews are the chosen people, the, the <laughs> microbiology of Moses, um, why uh, Jesus did not wash his hands before the Last Supper, why we don't eat cats, um, and, uh, and, and many other things. He gets into, uh, of course, what um, uh, many people are interested in, the, the paleo diet, and he debunks a lot of the, the dietary wisdom about low-fat diets and things uh, that, have been, that the establishment has been pushing lately. It's a very nice, um, he's not a fan of industrial food, but he is not a preachy vegan. He's not someone who goes on about sustainable farming. He doesn't want us to become hunter-gatherers or peasant farmers. Um, and um, he also has some wonderful thoughts about uh, why gyms are so awful, how we should exercise. Um, uh, that's a very brief summary of it. Now I'll, I'll ask John to just give, uh, uh, give us an overview of the Paleo Manifesto. Well, thank you for having me. Um, the, the, here's a quick overview of the concept. A lot of the health conditions that people suffer from today, uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, um, autoimmune conditions, uh, basically are mismatch conditions. And by mismatch, I mean they result from a mismatch between our primal genes and our primal biology and how we evolved and the lifestyles we lead today, our diet and uh, sedentary uh, activity patterns or lack of activity. Um, and, and so the, the basic concept is by mimicking key aspects of our uh, ancestral lifestyle or ancestral lifestyles, you can prevent the onset a lot of a lot of these chronic health conditions. So the book um, basically is, is three parts, past, present, and future, a short history of humanity, um, and then a, uh, the present, which is more practical, uh, which covers food, fasting, movement, standing, walking, running, thermoregulation, sun, and sleep, and then uh, a third part which is short and more speculative about where we're going, uh, focusing more on ethics and the environment. Um, and, and the theme throughout all of it is starting to take human evolution seriously. Now why are, are libertarians drawn to the paleo concept? That, that's a good question. The, the, it's multifaceted. There are a few different answers. The, the first thing is that if you look at the organic movement and the existing uh, food movement, um, it really sprang out of vegetarianism. If you look at early, early, uh, the early organic movement, it's almost exclusively vegetarian. Um, and there was a lot of political and ideologi ideological baggage that came along with that, that point of view. And so there are a lot of people who have been interested in optimal health um, or, or simply just good health who have felt excluded from the food movement because it meant buying into all these other beliefs. So there was latent demand, uh, I think, for a, for a point of view um, like this. Another factor is that libertarians tend to understand the power of spontaneous order, of how you can get very intelligent outcomes from decentralized solutions, as in a, like in an economy, um, that, that you can have an intelligent, an emergent order. Um, and, and you see the same thing in biological evolution. You have these intricate, incredibly well-coordinated organisms and life forms that have come about over millions of years of decentralized 
tinkering and decision making um, and, and aren't the result of a single centralized authority. Uh, libertarians tend to be a little bit uh, less religious and so are open to ideas of evolution. Um, and then there's some other factors like uh, paleo folks don't shy away from eating meat. And <laughs> there's, there's a masculine strain a little bit through libertarianism um, and, and paleo, even though these days paleo is about 50-50 male-female. That's still, so, sometimes people will read articles in the press and paleo will be, um, will be portrayed as sort of this macho, eating raw meat straight off the bone, you know, hardcore CrossFit people, rah, rah, rah. Um, and, but when you actually look at the people who are doing it, it's about 50-50 male-female. That's far more male than pretty much any dietary approach out there because most dietary approaches um, are about 80% female, whether you're looking at diets or veganism and vegetarianism. So it's, it's actually, I, I think of it as an approach for humans, um, but relative to other dietary approaches, it's a little bit more masculine. Um, and libertarians are willing to think different and go against the grain, so to speak. And, um, and, and, and so you certainly need to, to think different to, to take this approach and go against the conventional wisdom in certain ways. And then when you look at, <laughs> when, when I'm talking to a libertarian and, and, and I make the point that the USDA food pyramid is not God's truth, they're like, oh, right, <laughs> oh, right. of course it isn't. You know, it, it doesn't require a lot of persuasion um, to libertarians that, that the official federal guidelines on diet are wrong. So I think all of those together combine. <laughs> well, I'm shocked to hear that the guidelines are wrong. Can you, um, can you tell me where the federal government and maybe also where modern um, agricultural society went wrong? Well, the, bi the big picture view is that People started eating a lot of industrial food after the Industrial Revolution. So refined sugar, refined flour, hard alcohol became more common and, and, and more inexpensive. Um, uh, uh, Crisco and vegetable oils and things like that, and, and, and Big Macs and Twinkies. And we know that humans are not adapted to industrial food. And you see obesity and diabetes. So everybody sort of gets that we're not adapted to industrial food. So the logical next step is, okay, well, what did we eat before we ate industrial food? Well, most people were farmers, and farmers grow grains, and they have herds of cattle with which they milk for dairy, um, and so we should go back to that. Well, it, that's correct insofar as um, avoiding industrial foods is pro in, in, in Avoiding a heavily industrial diet is probably a good thing, but it, it's not correct in thinking that that's the optimal human diet. Um, we've only been eating agricultural foods for at most about 10,000 years. Um, so, so, so that's one area where we went wrong. But then also you, you, you just look in the 19, um, in the 1970s, George McGovern uh, chaired a Senate committee um, that established dietary goals for the United States. And that's when a lot of the anti-fat uh, orthodoxy got put into place officially. Um, and when you started to see a greater push by the government to eat less fat, and fat usually meant fewer animal products, and eat more carbohydrate, which usually meant grains, practically speaking. Wheat, corn, and legumes like soy. Um, so, so in our political history, that's really when um, you, you start to see uh, th the shift to w what I believe to be incorrect dietary guidelines. Right. And good scientists at the time were saying we don't really have any evidence for, th uh, for the benefits of a low fat. I mean, there were a few activists sort of in the American Medical Association and kind of, you know, consumer activists pushing this, but there were people saying we don't really, you know, know, know that it's true. That Health science in human beings is very difficult, no matter what you believe. Mm -hmm. um, it's unethical to run properly controlled tile, uh, uh, trials and dietary interventions. Um, 
because in, unless you're dealing with a prison population, what do you, how are you going to ensure that people are actually eating what they say they're going to eat? Um, a lot of the studies that have been done on nutrition have been done based on self-reported questionnaires of what people remember having eaten over the past year. So how, no matter what the outcome, how are you supposed to get good scientific results from something like that? And the answer is, you can't. Um, but people have treated some of the early uh, nutrition science as uh, sort of as the gold standard, even though it was often very poorly conducted, pretty much no matter what the outcome was. Now, um, why don't you just tell us you know, very briefly what's in the paleo diet? And also, um, speaking of scientific evidence, is there much you know, data for the paleo diet? So the, the, the brief overview, um, everybody agrees that too many processed foods, i.e. industrial foods, aren't good for you. Where paleo differs from the conventional wisdom is primarily around grains, legumes and grain products, wheat, corn, soy, um, and then around dairy. Um, the way that most people eat paleo is they tend to be more strict about grains and grain products, particularly wheat and soy, a legume. Um, and then there's more flexibility and, and differentiation in how people treat dairy. A lot of people, um, particularly of European ancestry, um, who are lactose tolerant, do eat some traditional full-fat dairy. So that, that's the quick overview of, of it. Um, and then in terms of the science, you know, the, the research cycle for studying these things tends to be five to seven years from when a topic starts to gain an interest to when studies get, people start applying for grants, studies get funded, research gets done. So really in the next two to three years, we'll see a lot more uh, studies coming out and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start to see what the science says. There, there have been studies that have been done where you take indigenous populations, you return them to their traditional diet, all sorts of health problems clear up. There are other small trials that have happened that are very promising, but um, more needs to be done. Now, there's a conventional wisdom that the vegetarianism has been shown to be healthier than uh, the needed meat that vegetarians do better. What's the, uh, what are the facts on that? If... Uh, if you take sort of an ecologist perspective or an anthropologist perspective on vegetarianism, it's sort of a funny concept. It's like humans are omnivores. We've been omnivores since before we were human. And, and not just plants and animals, but insects and fungi and all sorts of different things, particularly since the advent of cooking about a million years ago. We've eaten pretty much all sorts of things that, that we could get our hands on. And to think that somehow the optimal human diet just sort of magically there's this clean line between things that have a face and that make us feel sad for them <laughs> are unhealthy and things that don't it's it's pretty ridiculous and and if you're talking to evolutionary biologists veganism just gets laughed out of the room it's it's not even a hypothesis that that's taken seriously a lot of the um a lot of the evidence for, for vegetarianism and basically any dietary intervention is if you remove industrial foods, uh, white flour, refined sugar, vegetable oils from people's diet, they're going to get healthier. No matter what, whether it's Atkins or vegetarianism or any of that. Um, when, when you look at a lot of the studies that have shown positive effects for vegetarianism have been conducted on the Seventh-day Adventists, which is a, a religious group, um, a close-knit religious group, um, that is very different in many aspects from other people. Um, and when you actually compare Seventh-day Adventists to Mormons, who are, who are more similar than people in the general population, but Mormons will still eat meat, um, Mormons perform better than the general population at large. So um, it's, it's, it's not at all clear that removing meat from the diet um, is, is actually the driver of better health outcomes among Seventh-day Adventists. Well, I'm sure we're going to have more questions on diet, but, uh, uh, but before we open it up, I just wanted to, uh, to ask you about why are Jews the chosen people here? <laughs> so <laughs> I, have a, I have a chapter in my book. My book, even though it's called The Paleo Manifesto, um, it's not just about the Paleolithic. Um, and 
there has been adaptation to new ways of living and new foods since the Paleolithic, both cultural and genetic. And I have a chapter called Moses the Microbiologist about cultural adaptation to uh, living in cities, which was the most dramatic change since the agricultural revolution. It w diet was important, but primarily important insofar as it allowed larger populations to congregate in cities. And the greatest health challenge in cities was infectious disease. And it's around this time when you start to see early religions like Judaism emerge that place a huge emphasis on hygiene and cultural practices like hand washing and bathing and avoiding bodily fluids and harsh sexual, uh, sexual codes. I mean, and, and these, a, a lot of these uh, practices in retrospect were um, effective ways of avoiding contamination or infectious disease. Um, which was the number one source of mortality. So I, I have this chapter where I propose what I believe is a novel hypothesis for the emergence of monotheism, um, which is basically that if you have a, gr a community of people, uh, say the Jewish people, Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrians would work too, they're very similar. If you have a group of people um, that follow a scientifically sound hygiene code, and it is enforced throughout almost the entire population, then that group of people will suffer a lower infectious disease burden. Things like protecting their water supply, hand washing, things like that. Things that are in the Bible, um, in the Torah. And so it will look like this group of people is favored by God because they're dying less. People don't know that germs are killing people, and so, and, and so they attribute all these deaths to God and divine retribution. Um, and, and then if sinning is defined as unhygienic practices, which is totally uncontroversial and very well established, then, then the people who sin by getting tattoos, by participating in sacred prostitution, cannibalism, they will be more likely to get infected and die. And it will look like they're being struck down by God. Um, and if you have false gods all around this hygienic, scientific god, then these, quote, false gods um, will actually, and, and say these false gods are promulgating unhygienic practices like tattooing or sacred prostitution, they will actually be functionally incompatible with a, quote, one true god that is, has hygienic um, uh, practices. So you could, you could actually get a dynamic where a, um, basically, this, this very uh, abstract, the Jewish God is known, f known for being abstract and faceless and depersonalized and very rule-bound, well that actually describes science fairly well. And so you could actually have a scientifically sound hygiene code that was unitary of one mind that came in conflict with all these superstitious false gods around. So that's, uh, that's actually 10 years from now I think is going to be the part of the book that um, I think will still be most unique. Um, even though it has nothing to do with the paleo diet. Well, how did Jesus get away with not washing his hands? Well, so this is, this is interesting. So Jesus, one of his big points of contention with the Pharisees um, was over whether he should wash his hands before eating. And he said, this is silly. You don't have to, why, why do you have to put your hands together and run water over them before you eat? And all the Pharisees said, they freaked out and they said, you have to wash your hands before you eat. Are you kidding? That's gross. <laughs> it's in three of the Gospels. It's in three of the Gospels. It's on... It's Those on very words, I think. Right? Eh, well, it's, you know, in, in, uh, in Hebrew, I, I don't know the translation. Um, <laughs> um, and, 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 and so basically, Jesus took fundamentally um, Jewish uh, moral beliefs but basically jettisoned all the purity code and the hygiene code. Uh, circumcision, hand washing, uh, food kosher law, um, all these things that made the Jewish people, ma made it uh, costly to be Jewish. And it was hard to get converts. Um, but you get rid of that purity code and you just keep the moral teachings. And if you do it during the Roman Empire, when people are, there's a civic and secular religion of uh, public baths, aqueducts, so clean water, um, uh, and public baths, aqueducts, and, and just generally uh, a relatively cleaner technology, 
then um, you can get rid of all the costly hygienic practices, keep the moral code, and it spreads really quickly. But eventually you're saying that the Christians paid the price. With the Black Death. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's right there in, Christ, in, in, in the Torah. It's right there in the Holy Book. That if, if you, uh, so, so basically, the, the Jewish people, um, one of the definitive moments in the identity and formation of sort of the people of Israel, the Jewish people, is the flight from Egypt. I'm not speaking about the historical accuracy of, of that event. But the story is there's a group of people that is mysteriously resistant to pandemics and plagues. And soon afterwards, when they're supposedly in Sinai in the desert, their God commands all the Jewish priests to wash their hands a lot. Hand washing is the most effective and simplest form of hygiene ever discovered. It's Nobel worthy. Um, so, so and, and then you have all of these... Um, you, you suddenly get all of these rules that many of them are scientifically uh, sound. So, um, I, I, and, and right there, it says if you stop following these rules, then I'll strike you down with all sorts of nasty diseases, itches and boils and insects and infestations and uh, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of nasty things. So it was right there in the holy book that uh, what you should do to avoid plague. Well, and during the Black Plague, you said the Jewish populations actually did suffer less. Is that right? Well, th there were widespread rumors of that, and, the, and Jews throughout Europe were scapegoated. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christians said that they, um, that they had poisoned wells, which they did not do. Um, the evidence for Jews poisoning wells was that a lot of the evidence was that a lot of uh, Jewish populations would cover their well, which is actually a perfectly prudent thing to do if if you're protecting your water supply. Um, and and uh, if uh, vermin, rats, most insects are unclean in kosher law, so there was generally, to anyone who is observant, they would have been staying away from these species. Um, so if, if it, Christians at the time said that Jews were dying less from, from the plague, um, scapegoated them, tortured prominent Jews, extracted forced confessions, um, said that they were behind it, but it could have simply been that Jewish folks were washing their hands. Um, uh, one last question. Uh, um, you talk a lot about industrial food and you don't like it, and, but you also don't, uh, are not in Michael Pollan or, or anyone's camp on that. How do you see, um, you know, what should we be eating? What kind of food? How should we grow our food? And, and what should we do? What's, I mean, is it important to be organic in, in, in the whole sustainable food movement? This is an area where some of my libertarian beliefs have been challenged. Because growing up, I was a little bit of a libertarian fanboy, and companies could do no wrong. Or, or I, I might... Um, talk about negative things that different corporations would do, but I would often, at the end of the day, come to defend them. And then I realized in terms of my own health that, okay, if Kraft Corporation or Nestle, if Nestle is making infant formula for a hundred, you know, for a hundred years, and the science is overwhelming that breastfeeding is healthier for infants and mothers than, than infant formula, well, just because they release a new product and are making money off of it doesn't mean that it's necessarily good for you. Um, so some of my, I, I'm, I'm not, just because something is new and reformulated doesn't mean necessarily that it's better. At the same time, um, vegetarianism and veganism is so ideologically driven um, that um, that's not attractive either. Mm -hmm. So what I try to do in my own life, and it's difficult, is it's just a, I try to take the best of the old with the best of the new. My view of human nature is informed by millions of years of evolution and what came before. Um, but it doesn't mean I automatically reject something that's new. new I love new technology. I love living here in New York City. Um, I love the culture and technology. So it just means that you have to be discriminating about what old things you hold on to, what old principles, and what, what new things you adopt. Now, what do you think about the movement of sustainable food and local, you know, local wars and? Well, 
there's not, there's not enough land right now for everybody to just adopt organic farming. There's not enough land for everybody to just become, eat paleo throughout yeah. the entire world. But I, I, don't, I don't think that's really the point. Here, here's where I think vegetarianism has gone off the rails. The, the point of people eating differently is not that everybody in the world has to eat that way. It's that you're empowering entrepreneurs to experiment and to innovate. So if, if half a million people or a million people um, eat, say, say, say a million people eat vegetarian, and they want to change the food system. What they're essentially engaging in is a boycott on meat. The problem is boycotts are only effective if you have a large number of people involved in them um, or if it damages the reputation of a firm, so it has to be a, a widely held view within the population. Uh, vegetarianism is maybe 2%, 1% two percent of the population and most people eat and enjoy meat so it's it's actually an economic boycott is in a very ineffective way to change the food system um, and to encourage innovation you have all these entrepreneurial farmers who are experimenting with new methods of permaculture farming integrating technology to you know remotely know when the best time to yeah, rotate different crops are, trying new things, and that's great. And, and it, it's far more important to support entrepreneurs that are doing things that you like, to help them get off the ground, get the first dollar of revenue, their first dollar of profit, than it is to withhold money from the big guys who are doing something that you don't like. So I, I, I view a lot of this paleo stuff as um, voluntary consumers saying, this is how I eat, I feel good when I live this way, and I'm going to contribute money to entrepreneurs that provide something that I like. And, and so there, I, I don't, there's nothing like hippy-dippy about that. I just want, I just want more people, to <laughs> more, more entrepreneurs, to produce the types of products that I actually like and make, my, make me healthy and make me feel good. Uh, should we open up to questions now? <laughs> And, and is there, are there microphones no, here? Thank you. It's me again. Um, <laughs> first, I just want to say that was a really, really good exchange. John Tierney, your questions were perfect. And uh, it's just great framing. And, and John Durant, your responses were terrific. And, and your paleo diet as a, a, a way of perceiving culture and history and, and evolution and so forth and so on, it's just great. So thank you. Um, now you're going to lower the boom. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> actually, actually, John, I'm going to save the questions on evolutionary perspective for others. Um, uh, before I do ask a question that I do have, I just want to mention to everyone, since you, John Durant, mentioned the uh, uh, don't eat something with a face, there is a debate tomorrow night. Some of you know the Intelligence Squared debate series. And the resolution is don't eat anything with a face. It's a debate on veganism. They're very well done debates. If you'd like to, it's kind of sold out, but there are ways of getting in. If, if, it, if you're interested, Google it or, or ask me. So um, I'm going to ask a question about culture in the modern day, given my geographic, if not cultural, heritage. What do the French think of the paleo diet? <laughs> well, the... Um the, the f first of all, when it comes to uh, being pro-fat, the French love fat. There's a thing called the French paradox, which is the French eat so much saturated fat, and they have relatively low rates of cardiovascular disease. Well, that's, that's in line with, with a lot of what folks in paleo have also been saying. Um, the French eat nose to tail. Well, I eat nose to tail. Uh, the French follow uh, traditional uh, recipes and cuisines. Well, I think that's good too. Um, where there's a where there's some disagreement is primarily around grains and grain products. I would say that if somebody is having, um, if somebody actually has a health problem that they're trying to ad address, it could be a digestive problem, an autoimmune disorder, weight issues, mental issues, trouble getting pregnant. Then, then I would finger grains and grain products as, as the first thing, if we're not talking about an industrial diet. Um, and I'm 
quite sure that there are French people with irritable bowel syndrome who could benefit from experimenting with removing grains from their diet and see, seeing if it goes away. Don't all French people have irritable bowel? <laughs> it seems like it sometimes, doesn't it? Um, I had two questions. One, uh, my, my father and a lot of the older men I know dramatically reduce their meat intake. Just they get to an age and they just start eating less meat. Is, is there, I, I guess it's hard to consider that, um, you know, most of our ancestors wouldn't have been alive in their 70s and 80s, but do you think there's a physical reason for that? It seems to be very widespread amongst his generation. And secondly, we didn't really touch on the um, physical um, activity aspect of it very much, but uh, do I take it you would approve of my treadmill desk? Uh, of what? My treadmill desk. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, I use a standing desk, not a treadmill desk, but um, I think it's great to be on your feet as much as possible. They've, there have been a bunch of studies coming out uh, showing that um, even independent of whether you work out during the day or during the week um, in, for an hour or so, it's beneficial to be standing. And, and just being sedentary for most of the day has, has a lot of harmful effects. Um, and forget all that, I just feel more confident and assertive whether I'm talking on the phone or doing work when I'm standing up. Um, in terms of eating meat, there's an impression of paleo folks eating, being carnivores. I'm not a carnivore, I'm an omnivore. I didn't actually increase my meat intake when I went paleo. I basically switched out wheat, corn, and soy for a lot of vegetables and changed, improved the quality of the food that I was eating. Um, you know, older men uh, aren't, tend not to be as muscular, um, so, so that could be part of it. Uh, people do have different protein requirements and, and meat requirements. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have like an exact amount that I think is the same for all people, so I, I'm not sure I can answer it more than that. Hey, um, yeah, so um, what are your, could you elaborate on the connection between the paleo diet and mental health? And my second question, um, what are paleo people's ideas towards paleo libertarians? That is, people that are, yeah, it doesn't, it's not as it sounds, um, people that are socially conservative, yet, you know, endorse the libertarian ideals. Are people more liberal? Are people more like kind of new agey libertarian? Or are people more kind of uh, like socially conservative libertarian? So what was your first part again? So the first part was? What's the relationship between uh, the paleo diet and mental health? Oh, right. So if, in terms of mental health, uh, if, sometimes it's, uh, uh, most of the time, it's a lot easier to look at any particular health issue in non-human animals <laughs> rather than humans because everybody has preconceived notions about what's normal for humans. Um, you don't really see what could be termed mental health problems in, uh, in non-human animals until you get into zoos. In zoos, you see a lot of mental health problems, uh, what are called stereotypies, things like pacing back and forth. A lot of people see polar bears do this. Um, other types of repetitive movements, uh, lethargy, not eating, things that might appear like depression if we could talk to the animal. Um, so I do tend to think that a lot of mental health issues are mismatch conditions. The, the certain amount, temporary, um, temporary depression or feeling sad, temporary negative emotions, a lot of those are perfectly normal and they help motivate different types of behavior in life that's totally normal. Chronic, long-term mental health conditions, I think nearly all of those are mismatch conditions. In terms of what types of libertarians, um, I mean, you definitely get some crunchy cons, <laughs> some folks like that. But libertarians are optimizers, and you, you just get a lot of people who, who don't just want to feel okay, they want to feel great, they want to feel strong, and so they're looking for that leg up to, so you, you get, and you get a lot of non-libertarians. I mean, you get tons of non-libertarians. I mean, trust me, if, 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 if somebody has an autoimmune condition or Crohn's disease, something like that, and they remove soy and it goes away, it doesn't matter what your political beliefs are, you're gonna keep doing it. Thank you. 
uh, my question is uh, along the lines of how did the Jews get it right? <laughs> because, I mean, I think back and, and, and it was common belief that, you know, using leeches was the right way to treat was common belief to, to go off in a lot of other medical directions. And yet, as you point out, in this instance, some people got it right. How did that happen? It's really hard to say. I, you, you certainly do have a dynamic, basically a spontaneous order dynamic, where profitable, beneficial um, customs and practices can emerge without any coordination, without any one person knowing it or realizing it. If, if somebody just sort of randomly does, washes their hands more than other people, and that practice Ta delivers a huge survival and reproductive benefit, you know, it can spread throughout a population just like a genetic mutation can, even if people adopt it for the wrong reason. So the first step is realizing there didn't necessarily have to be a person, a single person that understood the germ theory of disease. Things can emerge. Spices, the practice of spicing our foods is an antimicro, spices have antimicrobial properties. There, there might not have been a person ever who said, oh, let's put salt and pepper and cumin and all these other things in food because it causes it not to spoil. It, it can just emerge. Um, but, basi but basically, if you look at um, when the Torah was formalized, it was soon after the Babylonian captivity, which is 500 and something BC. Um, and there are a lot of either Babylonian or Persian rules that are, um, that are in, the, in the Torah. So what I think is likely is that Zoro Zoroastrianism probably preceded Judaism, and, um, and it, a lot of these rules emerged there and were formalized into a coherent framework and then w imposed upon the Jewish people while they were slaves and then sent back to Israel. But I think a lot of these ideas, so, so I think a lot of them emerged, but then were formalized when the Jewish people w were slaves um, in Babylon. We could talk about that all night. Um, you may just answer this question. I'm not sure, though. Um, having been brought up Jewish, hearing this stuff, I can't help but kind of sit in my seat. Um, but the one thing you haven't talked much about is uh, diet which is interesting, considering the fact that paleo is a diet. So if in, I don't know too much about paleo other than my friends suddenly saying they're not eating bread and they're eating a lot of meat, you know, right. very vague. Um, and not being able to figure out why the heck I'm hearing about this at a reason event, you know, at first. <laughs> which is, but it's fascinating. Right. So my question for you is, if there is some link between what the chosen unit of Judaism, it's so nice when people talk about us like that. Um, when Judaism what might be linked to our habits, like our um, uh, washing our hands, but are there any links to our diet? Because there's a, a large part of what makes up Jewish tradition is the diet, and a large part of what, frankly, I rejected was the diet. And nothing that you've said yet about the paleo diet seems to link. So is there a link, or is it just? Well, the, everybody focuses, when it comes to kosher law, to kashrut, everybody focuses on pork and shellfish. Um, and I think that emphasis is misplaced. I think that's more of a product of we notice that uh, more today in modern times. Um, but if you look at kashrut, um, it gets a few big things right, which are don't touch corpses, don't eat anything that died of its own accord, stay away from vermin, and stay away from nearly all insects, aside from locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers, which don't feed on corp corpses, they feed on crops and plants, um, and, and are less likely to be a vector for disease. So if you just look, and, and then many of the other species, uh, I'm not the first one to point this out, by the way, I'm synthesizing this. Um, many other species that are banned are at the top of the food chain, uh, vultures, lions uh, or, or four-pawed animals, um, things that devour corpses. And far farmers, farmers know these sorts of things, that if a 
cattle dies, what species comes along and devours it. And in Zoroastrianism, the way they would get rid of human bodies, human corpses, they'd take it to a mountaintop and allow it to be devoured by wild birds and dogs. So we know people at the time were doing this, were using these species for corpse disposal. So if, if you forget about pork and shellfish and you just focus on uh, corpses and animals that died of their own accord, vermin, insects, and protecting species that devour corpses, that's really all you need. And the rest, you know, maybe, maybe there's some, just like there's genetic drift, maybe there's cultural drift or other reasons for things, and that's fine. The dairy meat combination, because that's a very specific thing. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, don't, yeah, don't, really weird one. Uh, you know, don't boil a kid in its mother's milk. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but, I, but I think if, if you get corpses, vermin, insects, right, and then you protect the species that eat corpses, vermin, and insects, you're most of the way there. There are, there are anti-parasite reasons for the, for the pork prohibition that were more relevant about you know, a few hundred years ago. Right. Trichinosis is a, is a common reason. Um, there's a reason. Milk and, and yeah, it makes more sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, we can, we could, people have been arguing about that for millennia. But also not, I mean, not killing cats and animals that devour rodents, that, that helps Right, so, so you might think that's an exotic concept to avoid certain species because they provide a service of corpse disposal, but how many people in this room have ever eaten cat before? Julian? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right, well, cat became taboo originally in Egypt because they self-domesticated and ate vermin. And it was very beneficial to have cats around to eat all the vermin. They provided a useful service. Um, it, it, as I say in the book, cook cats, don't catch mice. It's not enough to just cook the cat. The cat has to be alive to do what it needs to do. So if n the fact that none of us eat cat in this room is a, um, is, is a way in which we are all uh, not eating a, a top-level carnivore for ecological reasons. Um, it's hard to disagree with anything you said, and it's fascinating, by the way, and I think everybody in our socioeconomic class would agree with you. However, I want to play devil's advocate Please for a do. minute. Um, all of the things you describe in the paleo diet are not really scalable, and industrial foods are, and they're cheap as a result, and they feed millions. So I don't know that there's a question in here, but, but this, is, this is a, we're at odds here. Yeah. So, first of all, I don't think everybody in the world is going to immediately adopt a paleo diet. Um, and I think that's okay. Some people enjoy eating bread, some people are fine eating however they like to eat, that's okay. Um, so first, one benefit is simply that it encourages innovation among farmers, entrepreneurs, to find new methods that, that do scale better and that do have higher yields without necessarily using traditional, or not traditional, but industrial methods. Um, there's a great TED talk by Alan Savory about uh, how cattle can take desert areas and return them to grasslands. So um, re-entering the food system can be beneficial. Hunting uh, is, carn Carnivores and predators are an important part of natural ecosystems. We need hunters to be shooting deer and to be eating deer, and that's healthy. So I think paleo can play a different role in the food system than, say, veganism or vegetarianism. When you look at a lot of the solutions for veganism, to, to resource use in veganism and vegetarianism, a lot of it is just eat less meat. Okay, well, if everybody stopped eating meat, that's a one-time reduction in resource use, but people are still eating industrially grown crops and soybeans and things like that. Um, okay, so there's a thir you know, 30% less or 50% less use of, of resources. I'm not sure that that's a complete game changer. Um, what I think is more likely is people are gonna become wealthier, um, when people become wealthier, they're going to eat more meat. Um, we're also seeing a slow of population growth, so that's, that's putting some limits on that. And I think we're going to see a lot of change in biotechnology that is probably going to end up being the types of breakthroughs that we're looking for. Um, stuff with algae, fish farming, 
things like that. Well, how about just growing meat in the laboratory? I mean, do you have, when you talk about industrial food, do you object to producing, uh, I understand where grains fit into this, and you think the that our bodies are not um, suited to them so well, but, but just, you know, producing a lot of meat efficiently, either you grow it in a lab or you find new ways to do it, um, d does that trouble you, or does that? As soon as we start growing meat in the lab, mm -hmm. all of the liberal hipsters will switch from being vegetarians to only eating meat because all the plebeians will be <laughs> eating the, you know, the, the lab-grown stuff. Um, the, sorry, what, where were we? I guess what I wonder that if you use, use uh, um, industrial techniques, you're basically just modern, modern agricultural efficiency. And in the book, you say that I'm not, you know, urging everyone to, uh, to return to traditional farming because, you know, we'd all be poor. Uh, but I, I don't know where the answer is. And, and I, I actually wish more authors and thinkers would say that. Um, what I do know is that there's absolutely a role in healthy e ecosystems for hunters, and we need hunters. Um, there's abs I, I, I actually think that vegetarians and vegans are right in that we can extend the moral circle a little bit and and there are problematic ethical issues with factory farming so i think th i actually think they do play play a role you extend it to breeding like feedlots and um the excesses of breeding i don't think there's a problem with a cow that specializes in milk production um, I do think there's a problem if you're breeding chickens that can't even stand and tip over because their breasts are so large and are basically in some form of pain for, for most of their lives. I, I, at, at a certain point, if we're wealthy enough, I prioritize human welfare first, but at a certain point in a wealthy society, I, I, would, I would rather um, pay a little bit more. Um, but let, let me give a different reason, actually, for improving improving conditions um, that's very selfish. A lot of people focus on altruistic reasons. Completely selfish reason for changing the factory farm system is um, antibiotic resistant strains of, of bacteria. We are breeding biological weapons that are going to come back to haunt us. I mean, our, the, the antibiotics that we depend on for our entire monocle medical system and technology are gradually becoming obsolete because we're using them on cattle to make the cattle fatter, faster. A lot, and, and, and so all we have to do in a lot of these situations is give them a little bit more space, a little bit more clean water, a um, little bit more outdoor time, and you can actually cut back on um, a lot of the antibiotics because you have more hygienic conditions and uh, farmers shouldn't be able to use uh, this is a very libertarian thing unlibertarian thing but when when farmers simply use antibiotics to fatten up their cattle faster it puts everybody else in society at danger because th those those uh, antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria are are then dangerous to us when we go into the hospital, when somebody has pneumonia, when some, you know, when some child is trying to use antibiotics. So I, I, think, that's a, I think that's a very good selfish reason to, uh, to change the system. Um, I, I have a question. You, you, you've, uh, student, um, I, fa fabulous talk, very interesting discussion. You've said a lot of things which I think a, a proponent of regulation might agree with, and they might extend what you've said to say, well, in that case, hey, we should regulate the consumption of grains. We should regulate the consumption of sugar. Um, what, what, is, what, is, what is your answer to those uh, proponents of regulation? So what, particularly when it comes to what people should eat, um, anybody who has looked at the history of USDA regulations and federal government regulations of what people should eat, it is a history filled with misinformation and bad ideas. And so before we rush headlong into another point of view, even if it's paleo, even if it's my point of view, how about a little more humility and say, okay, we don't really know the answer here. Let's, let's just stop subsidizing 
certain ways of eating. That's a middle ground that everyone can agree on. Stop subsidizing the production of corn and wheat and soy. Start there and, and, and see what happens. Um, so though when it comes to antibi antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria, infectious disease is a network phenomenon. It, by its nature, very well studied, it requires coordination among almost the entire population to address it. When you look at vaccines, when you look at antibiotic resistance, um, public health measures. So that is probably the area, one of the areas where I'm least libertarian, and I think there's a good argument made for coordinated activity by a population. So we can, we can fight about that afterwards, but I will throw that out there. three quick questions. All right. Oh, all right. But <laughs> I don't know. You, you were pointing to these people over here, but I don't know who you saw. Uh, how about what, from over here, and then we'll go back over here to the lady in front, and then the fellow behind. Okay. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, you have emphasized, I think, that we eat too much grain, because, and that's a bad thing because genetically, until we discovered agriculture or invented agriculture, whatever the term is, we didn't eat grain. But uh, in the last, oh, five or 10,000 years, we have developed the ability to digest milk. Why don't you think, why wouldn't a similar sort of process have occurred right. with respect to grains and why, sh you know, so that kind So of ha haven't we adapted to agricultural foods somewhat? Right. We clearly, lactose tolerance evolved and evolved very quickly in multiple populations around the world over the last five to 7,000 years. Um, the, 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 so first of all, just because something's new doesn't mean it's bad. Um, so we can come across novel foods. You know, the first, the first hominin that was able to eat meat found a nutritious, a nutrient-dense source of, of energy um, and, and nutrients. You know, the first, the first hominin who somehow came across honey found a huge store of energy. Um, here's the thing about grains in particular. Um, when I think about grains, I actually think about seeds as a category. And by seeds, I mean grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, the reproductive organ of the plant. Um, plants can't run away from predators, so their evolutionary strategy is to either use shells, typically, or shells or casings, um, or chemicals, chemical warfare, to keep away hungry herbivores and insects. Um, and, 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 and so for that reason, you tend to see a huge amount of chemical diversity in the plant kingdom. They're the source of our medicines, they're the source of our poisons. They can be really good, they can be really bad, it just depends which plant, how you prepare it, and how much you eat of it. When it comes to seeds, those tend to be the source of nutrients, the, the most dense source of nutrients in the plant, it's the reproductive organ, it's the next generation, but for that reason, it also tends to be the most toxic por portion of the plant, um, or the, the part of the, the plant that is protected the most. Um, so you see a lot of fruit seeds are poisonous. Apple seeds have trace amounts of, trace to us, amounts of cyanide in them. Wild almonds have cyanide in them. A, a lot of different fruit seeds have cyanide-like compounds in them. Um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, pasture legumes that cause digestive problems or fertility problems in sheep and cattle because that's in the evolutionary interest of those plants. They don't want to be digested by the animals that come along. So the reason why my predisposition in paleo is against a heavily grain-based diet is because um, these, these plants are loaded with different naturally occurring toxins and poisons whose purpose it is, uh, whose purpose, purpose, evolutionary purpose, is to screw up our digestive system or to screw up our reproductive system so that we don't eat them. Um, so I actually tend to be fairly pro-dairy, um, but more anti-grain when it comes to novel foods, and that's the basic reason why. That's, um, that's the big picture view. We could get into like the biochemistry of specific oh. grains and legumes if we wanted to. Sorry, what are your feelings about fasting? 
Oh, I, th I think fasting's fabulous. I'll try to be as short as possible, and then I know you had a question. Um, and then we've got to wrap up. But um, w when uh, people are, are often, uh, there's all sorts of conflicting advice on everything in diet, including e e eating frequency. Should I be snacking all day? Should I have three meals a day, two meals? What should I do? Well, with every species, um, a good idea is to look at its eating frequency in the wild. Um, gorillas are herbivores. They eat almost all day long. Carnivores are more sporadic. They eat like lions eat every two to three days, two, two to four days in the wild. Um, and so when it comes to fasting, I, I consider fasting a form of eating frequency. It's a question about how often should I eat. Um, so the, f the first point is hunter-gatherers do not eat as regularly or as often or as much as most people do today, three square meals a day. So I think the correct direction is clear, which is we should have more periods of hunger in our life. Um, when it comes to the benefits of, of fasting, you see these fasting traditions emerge in religions all around the world, including Judaism, um, around the same time. And w one of the benefits of, of, of fasting is fighting chronic infections. Um, we all start living in cities, infectious disease proliferates, and suddenly you get all these religious traditions that are saying, okay, you need to have one day a month or an entire month where you don't eat for 24 hours or don't eat for 12 hours or 14 hours. And fasting is a way of basically cutting off the, um, cutting off the reserves and the supplies of pathogens that are infecting you. So I, I, there are a lot of other benefits of fasting, but I, I think that's probably why it emerged and can be very, very healthy. S animals across the animal kingdom will lose their appetite when they're sick or infected. So you can think of fasting as, a, as a sort of a pushing that strategy a little bit further and more purposefully to, to say, okay, appetite loss helps fight infection, Fasting, same thing. That might have been a little wandering. I think the wine is getting to me. <laughs> last, the last question, question Susan? Oh, yeah. Susan. 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 Basic question. A basic question. Good. The paleo diet, is it no grains, corn, soy? Is it certain types? Is it no sugar, not just refined? I just wanted to understand better the, the rules. And also, what's wrong with refined sugar? There's a great book that I can recommend that has all the detail you'd love. It's called The Paleo Manifesto. <laughs> um, and so my, my basic approach, everybody's a little bit different. My basic approach is to say, and other people's approach is, is to take a month, take three weeks, a couple months, and remove all grains from your diet. And then after that period, you see how you feel, you see if you've seen improvements, and then you incrementally add in different foods. And you may find, a lot of people find that rice, they don't have any problems with rice, particularly white rice. White rice is carbohydrate. Many more people find that wheat and gluten grains um, are more problematic for them. So at that point, you can determine for yourself what... Problematic in what way? Uh, causing terrible diarrhea or um, cause making their autoimmune conditions worse, uh, rheumatoid arth arthritis. Um, my sister-in-law's mother removed grains from her diet and the arthritis that it had been bothering her for 10 years basically went away. Um, and she went from not being able to sort of go for a walk for a mile to being able to walk five or six miles and not have it be an issue. Um, so you need to, I, I can give you some guidelines. Paleo is a great starting point. It doesn't have to be everybody's ending point. If you have a health condition you're trying to address, use it as a template, as a starting point to eliminate a bunch of foods from your diet. And then you have to take charge and be responsible and add in different foods and see how you feel. And you can craft your own diet. You can trademark it. You can name it. Um, that's right, you can be up here. Um, so so I, I guess I'll leave people with that. Use it, you can use it as an excellent starting point and then people can end up, uh, can end up in, a, in a lot of different places depending how they feel and what's important to them and meaningful to them and healthy for them. Um, 
Uh, thank you, John, very much for sharing the Paleo Manifesto with us. It's been great. Thank you all for coming. And um, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you.